unprecedented response. President Donald Trump takes drastic measures to try and contain the coronavirus. We're at the White House. Prayer for protection. The Holy Father also addresses the deadly outbreak, what he asks of the Blessed Virgin. Waiting for a verdict. An update on what could be the final appeal in Australia for Cardinal George Pell. And warning against indifference. Pope Francis tells the faithful about the importance of communication. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, March 12, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. We are tracking new developments tonight with the coronavirus. More than 126,000 people in more than 110 countries have now been affected. Stock markets have been cratering, schools are closing, and businesses are suffering and travel bans are in place. We have team coverage again this evening. We'll check in with Eric Rosales at the Capitol as Congress shuts down public access to the building. But we begin with Owen Jensen from the White House. Owen? Tracy, all eyes are on the White House tonight, and there's really two battles going on here. One is to stop the virus, two, to save the economy, and the president is meeting with world leaders to try to make it happen. This morning, as the Prime Minister of Ireland arrived at the White House, President Trump was there to greet him, and as you can see, there was no handshake. That's a big no-no right now with the global coronavirus crisis rocking the world. The two leaders said it felt awkward to avoid shaking hands when they met today. It always feels, feels impersonal or feels like you're being rude, but we just can't yeah. afford to think like that for the next few weeks. Ireland is closing all schools and cultural institutions until March 29th in a major escalation of its response to the coronavirus. And in a big move in the U.S., the president announcing last night in a primetime speech he's banning travel to the U.S. from most of Europe. The European Union not too happy about that move. The European Union disapproves of the fact that the U.S. decision to impose a travel ban was taken unilaterally and without consultation. Meanwhile, the markets rattled again today. The deepening crisis sent stocks into another alarming slide on Wall Street, triggering a brief automatic shutdown in trading for the second time this week. The president isn't too nervous about it. The stock market, as an example, is still much higher than when I got here. And it's taking a big hit, but it's going to all bounce back, and it's going to bounce back very big at the right time. And what about help for the American worker? Worried about losing that paycheck? Well, we're looking at a lot of things, including paid leave, and, and we're looking at many things. We're also making sure they're going to get their salaries. We have other workers, too, and those are people that work for tips, and nobody thinks about them. And we're including them in a lot of our schedules. While the disease spreads, fingers are being pointed. President Trump's national security advisor blames China for hiding the initial outbreak of coronavirus. Unfortunately, rather than using best practices, uh, this uh, outbreak in, in Wuhan was covered up. It probably cost the world community two months uh, to respond. Amid the fears, the quarantines, and the thousands who have died, it's been easy to ignore that 60,000 people have recovered from the illness, infecting regular people and movie stars like Tom Hanks. At the White House, the president was also asked about his contact with a Brazilian press aide who reportedly tested positive for coronavirus after their meeting. Let's put it this way, I'm not concerned. Also, the Fed is stepping in to help the credit markets. President Trump says he won't be holding any more campaign rallies for now. The NHL is suspending its season, and Broadway is going dark. Tracy? Oh, and thank you so much. Correspondent Owen Jensen reporting from the White House. Our Congress is shutting down public access to the U.S. Capitol until April, and a multi-billion dollar aid package pushed by Democrats who hope for a House vote today was halted. Correspondent Eric Rosales reports now from Capitol Hill. Eric? Well, Tracy, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy said that the Democratic coronavirus aid bill would actually hurt the very same people that it's supposed to be helping. He says if they are unable to make a compromise, then he and other Republicans are willing to stick around Washington, D.C. and forego their recess. I'm not concerned that we go on recess. I think we stay here. We get it right. Today, I asked House Speaker Nancy Pelosi if she agrees it's a good idea to stay. We need to just make a decision to help families right now because we have to operate not as business as usual but in an emergency status. 
where we have to get the job done. But if a decision isn't made, will you stick around? I'm not sticking around because they don't want to agree to language. In the bill, Republicans object to requiring emergency paid sick days for all businesses with no exemptions or end dates and putting the Social Security Administration in charge of paid emergency leave. The Democrats' proposal also calls for the temporary increase of Medicaid costs. After a closed-door briefing with medical experts, senators say we're still two weeks away from widespread testing availability. The tests that are being done are not coming back quickly. This is not like a rapid strep test where you can go and get a quick swab and then you know with in minutes. Uh, even those that are getting the test sometimes it's days uh, before they can get an answer back. So people that are showing symptoms have got to self-quarantine and they've got to be able to have limited access to other people until they can get answers back. Democrats say preparations are still inadequate. I am appalled and astonished that we have lost a critical two months. There's still no plan, no strategy for testing, for ventilators, for the basics that are required for people to survive because right now people just want to know, do I have it, do I not have it? And late this afternoon, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has decided to cancel recess schedule for next week. Meanwhile, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that she will continue to work with the Trump administration to try and come up with a compromise, and that would maybe put pressure on House Republicans to pass this bill. Tracy? Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. Thank you, Eric. Our Catholic elementary schools in the Archdiocese of New York will close due to the virus. The schools will be closed all next week with the possibility of a lengthier closure. School officials say this decision was made out of an abundance of caution. This afternoon, the mayor of New York City declared a state of emergency. Pope Francis offers a prayer to the Virgin Mary for protection during the coronavirus pandemic. Aiutaci, Madre del Divino Amore. The Holy Father prayed that we seek refuge under Our Lady's protection, knowing she will help us conform ourselves to the Father's will. Yesterday, the Diocese of Rome celebrated a day of prayer and fasting for the pandemic. The Pope's prayer was streamed live, followed by a Mass at the Sanctuary of Our Lady of Divine Love. Near Rome, Pope Pius XII prayed at the same sanctuary in 1944, pleading for salvation during World War II. And Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte ordered a nationwide lockdown on personnel, personal movement that is, in an effort to prevent the spread of any new coronavirus. Grocery stores, pharmacies and gasoline stations are among the few businesses that are allowed to stay open as they provide an essential service. Worldwide efforts to contain the spread of the new strain of the virus have accelerated. For most people, the coronavirus causes only mild or moderate symptoms, but for others, especially older adults and people with existing health problems, the virus can cause more severe illness, including pneumonia. Francesco Holmes, cultural mediator at Caritas Refugee Project in the northern Italian province of Lodi, joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Francesco. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about what Caritas does. What kind of work do you all do? So I work uh, uh, in, the, in a refugee camp in the north uh, of Italy, in this region of Lodi, which was the first to be hit by the coronavirus. And uh, I actually live in the town, Codogno, which was the first town to be hit. The first patient was found in Codogno. And, we, and I also have here one of my refugee uh, housing, because we have small houses the way that uh, we work here. And uh, so the, obviously we are still uh, up and running. This is, uh, we are an essential service for the state also, considered an essential service, so we have the uh, possibly we have the possibility to remain open and obviously we are there is no protocol for this situation so we are moving by improvisation we're trying to understand what we can do um, definitely uh, we have one priority which is to limit contact as much as possible and to attempt to limit in the the movement and contact of also all of our guests and the refugees that we have in our in our structures yeah, which sounds like it really impacted your work Yes. Well, definitely, I, uh, well, what we do is that uh, to limit their movement, we try to bring food directly to the place and medicine. And uh, mostly uh, we are working on gathering and translating information as much as possible uh, and relating it to our guests 
which are from all over the world and they speak different languages and not all of them know how to read and write. So we're trying to make short videos and, and short vocal messages that can be spread and make people understand. Yeah, A lot of the work is sensibilization. I know you had mentioned, uh, you know, you're living in that red zone area where the coronavirus hit the hardest. Can you talk about how sure. your life in particular has changed and maybe your neighbors around you? Well, um, my life really, except the part of, of uh, understanding re what the responsibilities are, mainly the difficulty was that at the beginning there was a kind of a mixed message from the government on one side there was a very strong measure which was the quarantine is closing all this area and closing Codonio especially the town where I live and on the other side obviously for um, perception management they were trying to say that it's uh, not a lot of people die and it's fine so the confusion the, the, the this contradiction really brought the population to polarize in, uh, in, in totally separate understanding of the situation people would go from being just terrified to think it's all fake and this was very bad for uh, <laughs> was very bad in, for the situation overall and I was lucky because I mean I working for other people and helping other people definitely uh, gave me the chance of uh, mobilizing my time and know what to do with my time so in that sense I think I'm one of the lucky ones for that reason I, I had stuff to do so it was it was good yeah. but it's yeah yeah, and the coronavirus, as I'm sure you know, now we're starting to get cases over here in the United States. Um, yes. As an Italian-American living in Italy during this time, very difficult time, do you have any, any advice for the American people right now? Sure, I, I actually do. Um, well, th the fact is that what seems to work is to, to try to, to create or at least promote uh, roles within even single ho households so that the responsibility is... Uh, seen as something you share directly with somebody else that you know, instead of having the government or a central entity gain, taking all the responsibility, which might feel like in, in the Italian case at the beginning as it, all these measures are imposed from the outside. And we have seen, I mean, I've seen a negative reaction, which is definitely detrimental for, for public health. So for people to be, to understand that we have to create, uh, in certain sense, a, a net of, of intertwined uh, responsibilities. Because it's it's either we're all understanding what we have to do, or it's not going to work. It's bad for us. Absolutely. So this is a, I would suggest that. Well, Francesco, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing all your insight with this, and we really appreciate it. Francesco Francesco Holmes, cultural mediator at Caritas Refugee Project. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, thousands of people in Venezuela took to the streets earlier this week demanding answers to the country's social, political, and economic problems. Hoy más que nunca queda claro que solos no estamos. Opposition leader Juan Guaido told supporters they are not alone and he is calling for free and fair presidential elections. The anti-government protests were held earlier this week. The country's Catholic bishops say they support the rallies. Coming up, an update on the fight for the unborn, including one state's attempt to ban abortion based on a diagnosis of Down syndrome. The Trump administration joins in the defense of an Ohio law that would ban abortion providers from performing an abortion if they are aware that a diagnosis of Down syndrome or the possibility of Down syndrome is influencing the decision. The Sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals heard the arguments yesterday in a rare full court hearing. Joining me now is Eric Dryban, Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Justice Department. Mr. Dryban, thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you, Tracy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, I know the Justice Department filed a friend of the court brief in support of the law. Explain to us why that was important to do. Well, on behalf of President Trump and Attorney General William Barr, uh, we decided that it was important for us to notify the Court of Appeals that the United States government believes that the law passed by the state of Ohio complies fully with the Constitution, that it is an appropriate measure to protect both the lives of unborn children with Down syndrome and that it sends a proper a message to the public at large that people with Down syndrome have lives that are worth living and protecting. Um, this measure was on hold for a while, since about 2017. Some say it's unconstitutional, but the government disagrees with that. Can you explain? 
Yes, the, the law passed by the state of Ohio is a carefully balanced measure that both protects the lives of unborn, that is those pr diagnosed prenatally with Down syndrome, but also it protects women uh, from possible coercion by abortion providers. And there is evidence in the record in the case that at least some portion of abortion providers do in engage in coercion of women upon receiving a diagnosis of Down syndrome. And so we thought, and we believe, and we argued to the court that the, the um, the Ohio law fully complies with the Constitution. Yeah, and that was one of the questions I was going to ask you about the coercion. So you covered that. Anything else you want to expand upon when it comes to that? Well, I think it's important to note that the, that the, the law has an important public purpose uh, in that it notifies both the individuals who, are, who receive a diagnosis with Down syndrome that they cannot be coerced by any medical provider into having an abortion, but it also sends a message to the public by protecting the integrity of the medical profession, uh, by sending a message that doctors cannot knowingly perform an abortion if they know the reason is a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. And we think that's important uh, for the integrity of the medical profession as well as protecting women and unborn children. Um, can you talk about the broader implications of the case when it comes to protecting people with disabilities from discrimination? Well, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal law that protects people against disability discrimination, including individuals who live with Down syndrome. It's a law that we at the Civil Rights Division enforce, and it's been a public policy of the United States for a long time, for several decades, that discrimination against people with disabilities is unlawful under federal law. Uh, we think the Ohio law is consistent with the purpose of the Americans with Disabilities Act in that it does make a statement that individuals with Down syndrome uh, have value and they, have, they are entitled to equal dignity before the law like everyone else. Uh, I know we've been reading a lot too about other countries that have um, I guess high rates of abortion for those with Down syndrome, countries like Iceland. Can you talk about that and maybe how this kind of relates to it? There, there is evidence in the case that certain countries have near 100 percent rates of abortion uh, when uh, there are prenatal diagnoses of Down syndrome. Uh, that is of concern, I think, of anyone um, and should be, especially coupled with evidence that uh, there, there, at least at times, that some women are coerced into having abortions after they receive that kind of diagnosis. The evidence in the record is that the, the percentages in this country are not as high as, they're not near 100 percent, but they are higher than one might expect. Right. Thank you so much for being on and shedding more light on this. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Tracy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, the state Senate in Utah passes a measure saying women who want an abortion must first see an ultrasound of their baby. The proposal now heads back to the state house for consideration. Six female state senators walked out of the chamber in protest before the bill passed. Also in Utah, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says that it will hold a major conference next month without any attendees. The group is taking precautions due to the coronavirus outbreak. The twice annual conference usually brings around 100,000 people to Salt Lake City. In Kentucky, church leaders say daily and Sunday masses will continue as usual. Earlier this week, the state's governor encouraged churches to cancel services as a precaution against the coronavirus. The Archdiocese of Louisville says that it has been in contact with the state's Department of Health and Wellness. Up next, analysis of Cardinal George Pell's appearance before Australia's highest court. Cardinal George Pell awaits a decision from Australia's High Court in the last possible appeal of his 2018 conviction for five counts of child sexual abuse. The justices reserve judgment at the close of the hearing with no immediate indication of when a decision will be released. Cardinal Pell was sentenced a year ago to six years in prison for molesting two 13-year-old choir boys in Melbourne's St. Patrick's Cathedral while he was the city's archbishop back in the late 1990s. Joining me now to take a look at the case is Edward Condon, D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency and a canon lawyer. Ed, great to see you again. All right, so can you remind our viewers, uh, you know, what is the basis for the appeal and what are those justices, what are they considering? So the basis for the appeal at this stage is the same as it was at the last, which is that the jury could not have avoided reasonable doubt in the presentation of the evidence in Cardinal Pell's trial. That basically they they elected to convict Cardinal Pell on the evidence of a single victim accuser, but that the defense put up 20 unchallenged witnesses against his account placing the cardinal in different places at different times and basically unpicking the narrative of the one witness against him. And the 
Pell's legal team were telling the justices in the high court in Australia that there has to be reasonable doubt in this case. Maybe you find the accuser credible, maybe you think he's a very compelling witness, but there's still got to be a reasonable doubt here. And what do you think? What do you think the high court will decide? Any likely scenarios? Well, there are really three options here. They could basically accept the appeal wholesale, quash Cardinal Pell's conviction, and let him free immediately. They could, of course, reject his appeal to the high court, and that would be the end of his um, legal appeals. He would be serving the remainder of his sentence, which is six years. Or the third option is they could kick it back down to the Court of Appeals with some sort of instruction about what they'd done wrong and what they needed to do again. That a lot of people are saying is at least a, a plausible outcome, if not the most likely. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cardinal Pell didn't travel to Canberra for the appeal hearing. Uh, any idea how he's doing? That's right. I mean, it's very unusual, vanishingly unusual, that um, defendants in these cases actually appear in person during the high court uh, appeals phase. But we have heard from people close to the Cardinal that he's doing well, that he's living um, what they are calling a monastic retreat in prison. He's currently in a maximum security facility along with. Uh, mafia leaders and figures like that, but that he's bearing up, that uh, his greatest suffering, we're told, is that he's not allowed to say mass because, of course, if you're in prison, you don't have access to alcohol like wine. Yeah. Uh, beyond the Cardinal's criminal appeal, what's the likelihood that he'll face a canical proceeding? Well, there's, it's an absolute certainty that when Cardinal Pell's civil legal process comes to an end, either with his acquittal or with, his, uh, with a reaffirmation of his conviction, there will be a canonical process in Rome. He is a cardinal. He's still a cardinal, a sitting cardinal, as it were. And he has been accused of sexual abuse of minors. So there will be a canonical process. Now, ordinarily in the church, what happens is they let the civil, court, the civil courts take their course, finish their procedure, and then begin the canonical process afterwards. So there isn't a confusion of the two legal fora at the same time. So one way or another, that's going to happen. Of course, if his conviction is overturned, I suspect it'll be a fairly speedy canonical process in Rome. Um, but the reverse is definitely not true, that if he's found to still be guilty by the Australian High Court, you can bet that there will be a canonical process in Rome and it will be as contested as the civil process. Well, Ed, thank you so much for analysis. We always appreciate it. Glad to be here. And finally tonight, Pope Francis warns us to not live in indifference. Noi viviamo nell'indifferenza. At his Mass today at the Vatican, the Holy Father described being indifferent as not caring about those around us, adding that there can be a great divide between the rich and the poor. This can be remedied by simple, simple communication with those in need and by doing charitable works. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.